Dead America, Seattle Part 6 Dead America The Northwest Invasion Book 8 Written by Derek Slayton Narrated by Aaron Smith Chapter 1 Day Zero Plus 26 This looks like another fun one, Sergeant Farley declared as he looked out over the high school ahead. Located on the southernmost tip of Lake Washington, the suburb of Renton played a strategic role for the invasion of Seattle. The 405 interstate came up from Tacoma, through the densely populated suburbs to the south of the city, leading straight up towards the eastern front of the war. Initially, the 15,000 troops that had been sent around Tiger Mountain State Forest were being sent further south to Tacoma to create a blockade so that the eastern troops could do their thing. The mission had changed on the previous day, when the order came down to divert thousands of troops back to the north towards Renton. The push had been difficult, with the streets jam-packed with zombies. Four miles to the east of Renton was the East Renton Highlands suburb, a densely packed residential area that they were having a difficult time pacifying. The fighting had been brutal, street to street, with many of the troops having to resort to hand-to-hand -hand combat due to the bullets running out. Two stories. Looks like it stretches for the entire block, Private Santos muttered as he appraised the Hanson High School. And with our luck, it'll be another one of those safe zones that they set up when things were going to shit. What's wrong, buddy? Private Sawyer asked, clapping his companion on the shoulder. You aren't in the mood to wipe out a couple hundred of those things? Santos just grunted in reply. Their supply lines had all but been cut as the aid had been sent to the larger southern force, leaving these troops short-handed. They'd begun using vehicles, dumpsters, and even furniture to block off roads and give themselves a fighting chance against the ever-growing ranks of the undead. Santos bent over to pick up a five-foot-tall metal post that looked like it had been ripped away from a chain-link fence. On one end there was grey duct tape that had been wrapped around for a handle, the other end crudely filed down into a spike. The first two feet of the tip was already stained a dark crimson colour. Even if I was properly equipped, it would suck, Santo said. But being forced to use discount brand fencing just... He sighed heavily. This was his first time seeing any action, either before or after the apocalypse. And he'd never in his wildest dreams thought he'd be caught in a zombie battle in the middle of a bullet shortage. Sergeant Farley squared his shoulders. Santos! Do you hear that? he asked calmly. The private furrowed his brow. Hear what? Farley interrupted him, reaching out and covering his teammate's mouth with his palm. Shh, he said. Don't talk. Just listen for a moment. Santos listened as the sergeant lowered his hand. All he could hear was the smattering of gunfire in the distance, as well as faint yelling. The main part of the battle still raged, this ragtag cleanup crew sweeping buildings on the outskirts. I... I don't know, he stammered. You don't know what you're hearing? Farley asked, voice cold. Let me tell you. He fixed his steel gaze on the young private. What you're hearing are the frontline troops fighting far more of those things than we're going to face in here, and they're just as poorly equipped as we are. He jerked a thumb over his shoulder. Now, if you like, I can have you transferred over to them, because, from the sounds of it, they could use the help. Or you can stay here, fighting in controlled conditions with people you trust. He raised his chin. What's it going to be? Santos took a deep breath and schooled his expression. I'm with you, Sergeant. Good, Farley replied, clapping his hands together. Have you figured out an incursion point yet? The private's brow furrowed. I thought that was Sawyer's job. We're in the middle of a war the sergeant said. One slip up, one bite, and Sawyer isn't around any more. Sawyer barked a laugh. That's a comforting thought, he quipped. When that happens, it's the next man up, Farley continued, unfazed. So you'd better know how to do his job after he's gone. Sawyer raised his hand. Again, comforting thought, he drawled. Can just feel your confidence in me oozing out of you, Sarge. Farley didn't react, knowing the private was more amused than upset as his demise being casually tossed around. Okay, 
Santos said slowly. Well, we checked the classrooms on the south side of the building, and they were pretty jam-packed. Like they were housing survivors before they knew about the blood type thing. We couldn't see into the gym, but heard some moaning and smacking at the door, so that's no good. A few of the classrooms on the north side had minimal resistance, but the most viable entry point was the front office. Okay, why's that? Farley asked, crossing his arms. Santos held up a finger. Well, no enemies inside for one, he replied. Easy access to the main hallway. Good, the sergeant said, nodding. What else? There's an interior door at the office, the private continued. So if we get inside and get overwhelmed, we would have a viable escape route. Farley cocked his head. But why not go in through the open back door we put a makeshift blockade on? He asked. Well, sir, we don't know where that leads to, as there are no windows nearby, Santos pointed out. We also don't know how long it's been open, so there could be a ton of those creatures in there. It's safer to go in through the office. The sergeant nodded. Good job, he declared, and then turned to Sawyer. What do you think? The private scoffed playfully. Oh, sorry, I wasn't aware I was back to the land of the living just yet, he teased, but then nodded. But yeah, Santos nailed it pretty good. All right then, Farley said. When the others get here, we'll get to clearing. Sawyer looked past his sergeant, nodding to the area behind him. Speak of the devil, he said. Farley turned around to see the rest of the team casually walking up, carrying a wide assortment of melee weaponry. Corporal Barnes led the way with Privates Burton, Graves, Logan, and Wilcox following behind. Wilcox and Logan were both coated in blood, but it wasn't bothering them. How did the clearing go? the sergeant asked. Barnes shrugged. Routine. Routine my ass, Graves barked. There were twelve of those fuckers jam-packed into a two-bedroom house. Logan nodded vigorously. It was like a slumber party of the dead. Sawyer appraised Wilcox and Logan, who were coated in blood from head to toe. Looks like you two drew the short straw, he drawled. Red's a good color on you, though. Logan wrinkled his nose and dropped a pile of material on the floor. Wilcox just grinned and spread his arms. Don't you do it, Sawyer warned, holding out a hand. Wilcox took a step forward. Oh, come on, big guy. You know you want a hug, he teased. No, 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 Sawyer demanded, both palms out now. I swear to God. Look around, his companion said, cocking his head. God can't help you. He darted forward, and Sawyer leapt away, his blood-soaked friend chasing him around to give him a bear hug. After a few moments of tearing around, Wilcox finally caught him and gave him a good squeeze, picking him up off of the ground. Sawyer groaned in disgust as the others laughed. I hate you so much, he whined as his friend put him back down on the ground. Wilcox grinned and gave him a playful wet smack on the forehead. Love you too, buddy, he drawled. Love you too. Farley stared down at the pile of materials on the ground. It was a wide variety of stuff, shovels, a pitchfork, and a six-foot-wide section of chain-link fencing amongst the pile. You... you brought a fence? The sergeant said, raising an eyebrow. Barnes shrugged. I thought it might be good to block off the door with, he explained. It'll take two people, but I figure one on each side pressing against it should be enough to hold it in place. I mean, as long as there aren't too many of those things in there. All right, we'll give it a shot, Farley agreed. You got us an entry point? Barnes asked. The sergeant jerked a thumb over his shoulder. Other side of the building, he explained, going in through the front office. Then what? The private asked. Standard room by room clear? Farley tilted his head back and forth. On the north side it will be, he replied. South side and the gym will be another story as they are packed to the tits with ghouls. That works for me, Barnes agreed. The sergeant waved a hand above his head. All right, let's get saddled up, he said. We got us a building to clear. Chapter 2 Barnes stepped up to the office with a crowbar in his hand. He studied it for a moment, investigating the lock and the edges. He shrugged, 
reared back, and then smashed out the glass, cleaning up the edges. There's some fine work there, Corporal, Wilcox declared. Barnes shook his head. Please don't reward me with a hug, Private. Wilcox blew him a raspberry. You're no fun. He hooked his hands over the windowsill and pulled himself up, hopping into the empty office. He gave the area a more thorough sweep than they'd done peeking in as the rest of the team joined him, carrying spears. Logan and Santos brought up the rear, carrying the fence. Barnes led the way to the door, cracking it open a touch and peering down the hallway. There were a few ghouls on the far end, but they weren't paying attention. The stairwell door behind them was closed, signalling the top floor was contained for the time being. He checked the other end, where the gymnasium lay. The doors also closed. He ducked back into the office. Okay, we go in groups of two. Check each room all the way down, he said quietly. We'll do the gym last, together, and then move up to the second level. Questions? Nobody said anything, so he slipped out the door, motioning to Burton to join him. She nodded and followed, and as soon as their bootfalls hit the linoleum, the trio of zombies at the end of the hall turned towards them, moaning. Duo raised their makeshift spears and moved up, leaving a few doors accessible behind them for the others to take. Quiet countdowns and door breaching sounded behind them, but they trusted their team and focused on the task at hand. The zombies were dressed in bloody button-down shirts and khakis, the business casual attire of school workers. One even still wore a pair of busted glasses, hanging low on its half-eaten nose. Not all that different from my high school teachers, Burton quipped and lunged forward, stabbing her spike into the middle of the ghoul's face. She wrenched it back and it didn't come out as cleanly or quickly as they would have liked, but they had to work with what they had. Barnes chuckled as he speared the second one through the eye socket. Not sure if you mean the brainlessness or the blood. Both, she replied as she took out the third and last hallway creature. Lots of fights at our school. They tried metal detectors one year to try to curb the knife wars, but then kids just started making plastic shivs. The corporal shook his head as he stepped over the corpses to double-check the stairwell door. Damn, girl! No wonder you're so badass. She peered into the first dim classroom on the left, seeing no movement, and wrapped her hand around the handle. He readied his weapon and nodded, and she threw open the door. Nothing came rushing out at them, so Barnes carefully stepped inside, sweeping the area. Burton followed and moved up the far row of desks. They'd seen horrific things in the past twenty-six days, and she was fairly desensitized to the ghouls at this point. But the younger they were, the more unsettling it was, the more sad. None of them were looking forward to finding young teenage zombies lurking around the school. Claire, Barnes announced, and they went back out into the hallway. Claire, Wilcox called from two doors down, and the duo crossed to the other side. Movement inside! Burton said and readied the door. Barnes nodded, and she did a quick countdown before throwing it open. Two zombies appeared almost immediately, each receiving a vicious strike to the face. Burton kicked hers in the chest to dislodge it from the spear, knocking it back into another shorter ghoul behind. Barnes slipped in, stabbing another creature through the forehead and flinging it back and forth to knock the remaining two around. Burton jumped up onto the teacher's desk, stabbing down with her spear like a fisher taking out two ghouls in quick succession. Barnes smacked one behind him with the blunt end, and then stomped one on the ground with his boot before slinging the spear at the remaining zombie that struggled to get to its feet. They waited a moment to see if anything else was going to come out of the shadows. Clear, Burton announced, and they retrieved their weapons, heading back out into the hallway. Wilcox and Logan emerged from the next room down. This ends good. Wilcox said with a thumbs up. Okay, let's head down and see how the others are doing, Barnes instructed. Hopefully the gym is empty. Wilcox rolled his eyes. Way to jinx us, Corporal, he drawled. Afraid to have a little hope? Burton asked, raising an eyebrow as they walked. Has anything in the last three weeks given the impression that hope is warranted in any situation? Wilcox quipped. Sawyer gave him a playful shove as they caught up to them. Way to be depressing as fuck, bud. Farley and Santos emerged from the last door on the left before the gym. 
spikes gleaming with blood. Clear, the sergeant declared, and then headed for the gym doors. The two of them peered inside as the team caught up to them. Santos murmured something in Spanish and then backed away from the door. That's never good, Wilcox muttered, and Sawyer rolled his eyes leaning against the wall where they'd set down the chunk of fencing. Looks like you were right about the safe zone setup, Farley said as he scanned the inside. There's beds and supplies and at least five dozen of those things. Wilcox shook his head. Nothing like using a school gymnasium as a bloodbath. How are we playing this, Sarge? Barnes asked. Farley pointed to the fence. Let's try your fence idea, he said. The doors open inwards and auto-close, so hopefully it can stem the tide so they'll come in smaller groups. Graves, Logan, you hold the chain link on either side. Barnes, you take the center, in case we need to brace it. The soldiers got into position, and the corporal reached over the fence, resting his hand over the latch bar. He did a countdown, and everyone readied their spears. At the end, Barnes shoved each door open in turn mightily, giving them good momentum to swing open. Zombies immediately flooded the gap, pressing into the fence, snapping and snarling. The corporal stabbed one in the centre, but already Logan and Graves struggled to hold the fence in place. He ducked down and threw his weight into the bottom centre of the chain link, hoping to relieve the pressure and create an effective barrier for the ghouls. The doors couldn't shut again from the tide of zombies clustering around the entrance to the gym, all of them coming towards the noise and pushing forward like a mosh pit of rotted flesh. The soldiers sprung to action, stabbing and lunging forward as best they could. Bodies fell to the floor, creating a bit of an added barrier to the fence. It acted like a battering ram for a time, until the unmoving corpses were so thick that the ghouls clambered up on top of their dead brethren. Raise the fence! Farley barked as the zombies had a higher floor to fight against the chain link barrier. Barnes rolled away as rotted claws began to reach through the holes at him, the ghouls clamoring over each other at different heights to get at their meal. Logan and Graves grunted with the effort of holding the fence in place, but the spikes were too thick to fit through the holes of the chain link. Ideas! The corporal barked as he turned his spear around to try to hold the fence in with the blunt end. The doors were stuck open on the hoard, and at this point the fence covered the entire doorway to keep the ghouls from vaulting over the ramp of bodies beneath them. Before the sergeant could answer, Graves slipped to one knee, and the ghouls pushed through. Burton and Sawyer darted forward to try to push the fence back into place, throwing their weight against the fallen soldier, and Santos stabbed wildly with his spear above their heads, trying to protect them against the flailing arms. Shouts filled the hallway echoing and unintelligible in the panic. Graves' blood ran cold as a tight grip wrapped around his wrist, and he thrashed, putting his boot against the wall and throwing his body backwards. Burton and Sawyer staggered back from the movement, and the fence buckled, zombies pouring out of the hole. Fall back! Farley screamed. To the office! Corporal! Burton yelled as the horde consumed Graves the fence falling down on top of Barnes as the zombies slid down into the hallway. Logan darted back, narrowly missing the outstretched arms, and the soldiers tore for the office. The majority of the ghouls stopped to feast on graves, whose screams died down into gurgles and then nothing as they tore out his throat. As Logan reached the office last, he looked back one last time and saw Barnes underneath the chain-link ramp, pressed up against the pile of bodies. Chapter 3 Logan slammed the office door behind him in the nick of time as the hallway zombies smacked into it, slapping their hands wetly on the glass. Corporal's still alive! He's trapped under the fence! He huffed. Santo shook his head, eyes wide. He'll never survive under there! Logan clenched a fist. We still have to try! Whatever we're trying, we still have to clear all the zombies! Burton snapped. What's the plan, Sarge? Farley didn't answer, simply flipping his spear around and smashing the blunt end into the glass window of the office door. Snarls and moans filled the air, and he turned the spear around again, stabbing at any head that came into view. Sawyer grabbed a chair and swung hard at the waist-high window along the wall to the hallway, cracking the glass. The others joined in and soon packs of ghouls lined up against it, clawing at them over the jagged edges of the sill. 
The soldiers formed a stabbing line, taking down ghoul after ghoul after ghoul, until the hallway was littered with bodies. Farley opened the door and stuck his head out, just in time to see Graves sit up and scream. To his surprise, the dead soldier tore into the gym instead of his way, and that was when he realized Barnes was no longer beneath the chunk of fence. To the gym! he barked and drew his handgun. Ammo was scarce, but a runner was a bigger threat than a horde, and they'd need to take it out quickly, lest they risk a second one in the form of an undead corporal. As the soldiers filed into the gym, fanning out, they laid eyes on Barnes dancing along the seats of the bleachers, occasionally stabbing down at a zombie head. Graves was almost to the bleachers, tearing towards the cluster of two dozen or so ghouls, trying to get to the corporal. Farley took aim and fired, the bullet tearing through the dead private's head just before it reached its murderers. The noise alerted the horde and they abandoned their quest of the difficult-to-navigate bleachers in favor of the fresh soldiers approaching in a spread-out line. Barnes took the opportunity to jog down the seats, stabbing a few ghouls in the back of their heads in quick succession. Farley holstered his gun and he and his team spread out further, surrounding the zombies in a wide semicircle. The free-for-all began, spears flying, skulls crunching, bodies falling, and coagulated blood splattering everywhere. In a matter of moments, the horde was no more, festering in a wet, putrid pile in the center of the gymnasium. The soldiers stood in silence for a moment, their eyes trailing to their dead companion laying face down on the shiny floor, body half-eaten. Logan scrubbed his hands down his face, shaking his head and storming away from the rest, growling under his breath. "'You all right, Corporal?' Farley asked. Barnes nodded. "'Yes, sir,' he replied. "'Manage to get out behind them and run in here.' The sergeant returned to the nod. "'We need to clear the top floor,' he said. Burton glanced at Logan and then back to her superior. "'Sarge, shouldn't we?' "'We don't have time, Private,' Farley cut in. Move out, we have to scope out the stairwell. He turned on his heel and started back towards the hallway. Santos, Wilcox, sweep the storage and locker rooms and then join up with the rest of us. Yes, sir, the men said in unison and headed over to the far side of the gym. Burton stared at Barnes, raising her eyebrows. He shook his head and clapped her on the shoulder. Sarge is right, he murmured and walked past her to follow Farley. Logan pushed off of the wall, gripping his spear with white knuckles, jaw set tight. Burton offered him a sympathetic smile, but he ignored it and stalked after the sergeant. Farley cracked the fire door as gently as he could, listening for any movement inside, or to see if a horde pressed back against it. There was nothing, so he pushed it open farther, shining his flashlight up the stairs. A moan echoed and then a ghoul fell over the top railing, sailing down and cracking its skull upon impact at the bottom. It was silent after that. Well, that took care of itself, the sergeant muttered. Santos and Wilcox sauntered up the hallway, having found nothing in the extra gymnasium rooms. Farley led his team up the stairwell slowly, keeping their footfalls as light as possible. The top door had a small rectangular window, and he peered through it pursing his lips at the sheer amount of movement in the hallway. As the doors were open all the way down, giving no break in the amount of corpses shambling around, he turned around and waved for the team to huddle in so they could hear him. At least three dozen, maybe more. I can't get a read on the far end of the hallway, he murmured. All the classrooms I can see are wide open. Thoughts? The group contemplated for a moment, and then Santos raised his hand. What if we try to break them up? he asked. Kick him into the rooms and shut the doors so we can try to thin out the rest. I think that would only work for one or two rooms before we're overwhelmed, Sawyer whispered. As soon as they hear us and start pushing for us, we're boned. Did any of them have big windows? Burton asked. If we could get into one or even two across the hall from each other, we could do like we did from the office. Farley shook his head. They're all classrooms with tiny windows in the doors. Santos raised his hand reluctantly. This door opens inward, he began and paused, scratching the back of his head. Maybe the fence would work better here. No, Logan growled, shaking his head. We're not using that thing again. 
This is way less of those things than the gym, Santos argued, though he winced away from the death glare he was receiving from his teammate. And we could get a stronger angle here. Logan crossed his arms firmly. Until they push just enough to knock us down the stairs, he hissed. We'd be fucked with them falling on top of us. How far down are they? Barnes asked, turning to the sergeant. Could we make it to one of the classrooms? Farley nodded. Could probably make it down too. What if half of us made for a classroom and then we ping-ponged them back and forth? Barnes suggested. Switch off being the distraction while the other team takes them out from behind. There was a moment of silence as everyone contemplated the idea. Best we got, Sawyer said with a shrug. Farley nodded. Sawyer, Logan, Wilcox, on me, he said. We go for the second classroom on the left. Logan and Wilcox bring up the rear and secure the door. Sawyer, we clear the room. Once we're in, Barnes, your team starts making a ruckus. Once those things have passed, we'll start taking them out until they focus on us. Then it's your turn. Got it, Sarge, Barnes replied with a nod. Farley cracked the door and peered through to make sure they could make it to the target classroom. He held up a hand, doing a silent countdown from three, and then darted out into the hallway, three soldiers hot on his heels. He stabbed a zombie through the chest and used it as a battering ram for the few ghouls in their path, and when they reached the classroom, he put his foot against it to tear the spike free, giving it a mighty shove backwards. His chest heaved as he rushed into the classroom behind Sawyer, who was already stabbing at zombies inside. I don't know if we thought this one through, Sarge, Sawyer cried as he leapt up onto a desk, using his spike as a club and playing whack-a-mole with the numerous creatures below. Too late now, Farley barked and hoped to hell that Wilcox and Logan could quickly secure the door and back them up. He stabbed a zombie in the head and flung it sideways to knock over two more. Sawyer leapt down from his desk, drawing his knife and dropping his spear in the close quarters, stabbing skulls in quick succession. A zombie latched onto the back of his shirt and he screamed, arms flailing, as he lost his balance and fell to the floor. As a rotted face came into view, lunging for his face, he pushed up, but the zombie stilled, a spike emerging from its mouth. Logan shoved the body aside and held out his hand to help Sawyer to his feet. The quartet looked around at the bodies strewn across the classroom. Wilcox stood against the door which was latched tight but zombie hands smacked against the outside. Claire, Sawyer muttered and gave Logan a nod for saving his neck. Stay away from the window, Farley instructed, and the soldiers ducked down to wait for the other team to draw the ghoul's attention. After a few tense moments there was a racket in the hallway, clangs and yells and hollers. The smacking stopped and Wilcox popped up to peer out of the small window. He stayed stock still, watching as the horde filtered by and then lowered down again, turning to Farley. I think there's too many of them, he hissed. I don't know if they'll get far enough down that we can get behind them. The sergeant nodded firmly. If they don't, we'll open the door and pick them off while they're distracted. If there's enough of an opening, we can head down to a further classroom. Logan took a deep breath, muttering something under his breath that sounded like it had something to do with the word fence. Sawyer bit back a smart remark, knowing better than to pester his grieving friend. I think that's it, Wilcox murmured from the window. They're all packed in tight, pushing for the stairwell. They're only a few feet past the door. We'll take out as many as we can while backing up to another classroom, Farley said, readying his spear. Sawyer loosened up his shoulders, hopping from foot to foot. An empty one this time, preferably, he quipped. Beggars can't be choosers. Wilcox shot back, and then held up his hand to do a countdown for the door. When he pulled it quietly open, the four soldiers crept out and created a line across the hallway. It was just wide enough for them all to comfortably stand next to each other. The zombies were very interested in the stairwell door, which was now closed but still clanged and banged from the inside. Logan made the first move, stabbing a ghoul in the back of the skull. The soldiers moved in turn two lunging forward as two picked targets, so that they worked tandem. As bodies fell, the back of the pack began to notice them, and began to turn and reach for the more accessible meal. As more and more shuffled towards the soldiers, they backed up but continued to strike, 
spearing ghoul after ghoul like fish in a barrel. When they were halfway down the hallway, the stairwell door opened, and Barnes's crew emerged, creeping quietly with their own weapons. At this point, there were only a dozen or so left shambling. Fuck the classroom, we got this, Logan declared, and jammed the blunt end of his pole into the stomach of a ghoul, shoving it back into the group, and knocking a few over like bowling pins. From the other side, Barnes dropped zombies easily, Burton and Santos clearing classrooms as they went. Soon the two teams met in the middle, and the corporal clapped Logan on the shoulder. He nodded, but turned away brusquely to clear classrooms on the far end. Before long the floor was cleared, and the team made their way back down to the first floor to make sure the doors were secure, so no stragglers could get inside after they left. Take five, Farley instructed, as they emerged into the schoolyard. His team sat down in the grass to take a well-deserved break. Chapter 4 As Farley studied his map, working out their route through more of the nearby buildings, Burton sat down next to Logan, who'd parked himself further away from the group. She held out a chocolate-covered granola bar that she'd liberated from the community center. He stared at it for a moment and then took it, peeling it open. At the risk of sounding like a total girl, she said as she tore open her eyes, chocolate always makes me feel better. He managed a chuckle and took a bite, shaking his head. Thanks, he said through a mouthful of granola. Sorry about Graves, she finally said, unscrewing the cap on her water bottle. I didn't know him very well. We met just a few days ago, but he was a good guy. Logan lowered his gaze. The best. He chewed his lip for a moment. Brave idiot. He volunteered for this mission. I followed him to keep him safe. He clenched a fist, eyes darkening. It wasn't your fault, she said. This war is like nothing anyone can predict. Try as we might. He nodded. I know. Shit happens and all that. He took another thoughtful bite and swallowed. Troops are dying constantly, becoming those things, killing more troops. Our life expectancy is a lot less than it was three weeks ago. Doesn't make it any easier knowing that. No, it doesn't, she agreed with a sigh. You guys been together long? He nodded. Been friends since we were kids, but the relationship is... was... no, he admitted. We were stupid for waiting so long, wasted so much time. Burton reached over and gave his shoulder a reassuring squeeze and opened her mouth to say more. But a squad of soldiers approached Farley. What's this? she muttered and got to her feet. Sergeant Farley, the captain asked as they reached him. Farley furrowed his brow. Yes? I'm Captain Rocha, the burly man introduced, holding out his hand. The sergeant shook it, but still looked confused. What's going on? We sent a team out at dawn to scout out the 405, the captain explained. We lost touch with them, and we can't make any assumptions about whether or not they completed the mission. We need to send another team, and I'd like it to be yours. Farley shook his head. With all due respect, he said, crossing his arms, why did you come out here to ask the aging sergeant stuck on cleanup duty? I asked around, Rocha said, a smile curling the corner of his lip. I said I was looking for someone with lots of recon experience, and, well, your name came up enough times that I couldn't ignore it. He tapped the radio attached to his hip. I got a bit of background information on you, and I've got to say, I'm impressed. Multiple tours and discharged with severe injuries, yet here you are, back in action. The sergeant avoided his gaze. On clean-up duty, he resisted the urge to pat his belly, given the fact that they'd been off duty for long enough he wasn't in the same shape he'd been in before he'd been discharged. Just doing my part to try to save what's left of the world, Captain. He tried to school the sarcasm in his voice. He did believe in the mission and doing his job, but he couldn't deny that he'd be supremely happy to be off of cleanup duty. Admirable, Sergeant, and now I need you to play a different part, Rogers said, pulling a folded up piece of paper from his pocket. He unfolded it and held it up so Farley could see while he pointed at different areas. 
I need you and your team to get to the 405 and scout it out, and then, if possible, push forward to the Renton Municipal Airport and secure it, so we can start bringing in troops from the water. The ultimate goal is to secure the 405 to prevent those things from moving up to the northern area flanks, and be ready to move when the groups push down from the north. I've got hundreds of soldiers prepared to come in once there is a safe landing zone. Farley studied the map, rubbing his chin. What's this area here? He pointed to a cluster of buildings. That's a retail center, Whitman Court, Roger said. The sergeant nodded. It's probably safer to hit the 405 south of that. Good call, the captain agreed. I have men pushing through there now, so it should be relatively safe to get to the highway. Farley turned to his team and held up his hands, palms out. What do you think? he asked. Want to go running off into danger? And skive off shit cleanup duty? Sawyer grinned and held up his spear. Hell yeah, Sarge! Chapter 5 Jesus! Wilcox breathed as they reached Whitman Court. A battle raged in the parking lot, zombies shambling out from everywhere, and soldiers smacking them down with everything they could find. The whole front of one of the stores was blown out, shattered glass everywhere, and ghouls poured out of it into the lot. Let's go! Farley barked, holding up his spike, and the team rushed down onto the asphalt, stepping up to help stem the tide. Burton tore up next to a soldier swinging a two-by-four back and forth, trying to keep zombies from swarming him. She stabbed one through the head, skewering a second like an undead kebab, and then kicked them off, sending a few more tumbling to the ground. Sawyer took the left flank, using his post like a battering ram to knock a cluster of ghouls to the pavement. He set to stabbing them all, in quick succession with the spike, blood flying everywhere. Runner! Somebody screamed, and everyone perked up on high alert. Logan whipped around from a burly zombie he'd managed to crush with bare hands, just in time to see a ghoul in bloody army fatigues tearing across the wheelchair parking. He lowered his shoulder and caught it in the middle, flipping it over his head. The zombie hit the ground on its back and Wilcox lunged forward, stabbing at it. The ghoul was fast and flailed out of the way, darting towards Santos with its mouth open for blood. The young private froze in fear, eyes wide as saucers, but Logan threw his body into the dead soldier, pressing down on its throat with his hands, struggling to hold it down. Kill it! he bellowed, but before Santos could react, Sawyer flew in and stabbed the ghoul in the top of the skull. When it fell limp, Logan leapt to his feet and turned to Santos. You can't choke like that! he snapped. Do you want to die? I... I... The kid stammered. What are you, like a year younger than me? Two? Logan demanded, pointing his finger in his face. You need to get your shit together, or you're not going to make it through this war. Stand down, soldier, Farley said firmly. Logan huffed and backed off, then looked around at the pile of bodies in front of them. There were still a few zombies staggering out of the store, but the original team seemed to have it under control. Let's go. The sergeant inclined his head to the south. We need to get to the highway. Sergeant, somebody called from the fray and approached him. I need your team to help us clear out these stores. Farley shook his head. Sir, I have my orders from Captain Rocha. We're to head up the 405 and— You have new orders, the captain said haughtily, raising his chin. Captain Monroe, one of the soldiers called from the front of the store. I can't find Ray. Sawyer motioned to the dead runner behind him. Is that Ray? Monroe cocked his head and pursed his lips. No, it's not. So, more potential runners? Great, Farley growled and waved to his team. Come on, let's get this shit locked down. Barnes motioned to the cart corral. What about those? he asked. We can make a barricade across the doors and just kill everything that comes up to it. Works for me, Farley replied and led his team over. They started pulling carts out and linking them together in a long line. Hurry up, Monroe urged, waving his hand above his head. The sergeant reared on him, eyes blazing. Corporal, he said, voice low and calm. Let's move out. I think the captain is good here. 
The soldiers dutifully stepped away from the carts, turning away from the store. No, no, fuck, Monroe said, holding up his hands. Do it your way, just do it, Sergeant, he huffed. But know that I'll be filing a report against you for your sass. He turned on his heel and strode back to his team. He's a peach, Sawyer muttered. Farley shook his head and rolled his eyes. Let's get this done so we can get on with our mission. They headed for the doors with the longest line of shopping carts they could make and maneuvered it across the broken windows. It reached all the way across and both teams spread out across it, melee weapons at the ready. Barnes banged his metal pole on the carts in front of him, whistling. Come on out, he yelled. Come get a nice long spear in your face, Sawyer bellowed, and zombies came flooding out of the aisles of the store. In the center, a fast-moving ghoul burst through, tearing for them. Barnes lined up his shot and jabbed out at just the right moment to spear it through the face. That Ray? he asked the soldier to his left. She shook her head. No, I've never seen that guy before. The corporal furrowed his brow. Not only did that mean there was still another runner in the store, but that somebody else had died here recently enough to still be fast-moving. Could it have been the scout team from the morning? They'd have to be careful. The mini horde hit the melee zone and the soldiers got to stabbing and smacking and shoving. The sound of skewering flesh and cracking skulls echoed as they took down their foes. Runner! Burton barked, and Monroe shoved her aside, pulling his rifle from his back. What the fuck is he doing? Farley muttered under his breath, and then sighed as the captain unloaded automatic fire into the fresh zombie. It fell, one of the bullets finding its mark, and the captain stepped back from the shopping carts as the last of the ghouls dropped to join it. Burton turned to the sergeant, eyebrows in her hairline, her gaze clearly conveying, what the fuck? Farley nodded and stepped away from the carts to approach the captain. All right, we need to be getting on with our original mission, he said firmly. No, I don't think so, Monroe replied, putting his hands on his hips and puffing out his chest. I think you're going to stay here and help clear out the rest of these stores. The sergeant shook his head. No, we're going to complete the mission that Captain Rocher sent us on, he declared. You're welcome for the help. Monroe pointed a firm finger at him. You have a duty. If you really want to push the issue, have at it, Farley cut in. I'll have my own report to file at your incompetence. The captain scowled and waved him off, turning back to his team. Let's go, the sergeant said and ushered his team towards the south. Hey, sergeant, one of the soldiers from the line said, approaching timidly. Thank you. That was a very good idea with the carts. Farley nodded. No sweat, he replied. Be safe. Yes, sir, the kid replied, saluted, and then ran off to join his asshole captain. The sergeant led his team back across the lot at a quick pace. Let's get the fuck out of here. Chapter 6 That captain is a piece of work, Burton muttered as they approached the road that led to the 405. Glad we're working with you, Sarge, Wilcox said. I didn't know you'd been discharged before all this. Farley grunted. Yeah, I was really enjoying retirement when the fucking apocalypse happened. Maybe once we get rid of all these brain suckers, you can go back to sipping margaritas by the pool, Sawyer said with a grin. The sergeant rolled his eyes. I'd settle for a good night's sleep in a proper bed. With fresh pancakes in the morning, Burton added, smacking her lips. Getting woken up with a blowy from a gorgeous woman? Wilcox added, waggling his eyebrows. Burton scoffed. I mean, if you want your dick eaten off by a zombie, by all means, she retorted. That's cold. Wilcox put a hand to his chest. Ice cold. Quiet, Farley hissed as they reached the highway and crouched down behind a row of bushes. Sawyer sighed. Of course there's a horde, he said. There's always a horde. There's only a few hundred, Wilcox said, tilting his head back and forth. No biggie. Burton raised her eyebrow at him. You're a soulmate in there? He smirked at her. You know it, he said. She rolled her eyes. We need to figure out a plan of action, Barnes said, and looked around. 
Across the highway was a small apartment complex that looked devoid of ghouls from the outside. What if we regroup over there? Looks like the horde sucked up all the stragglers. Farley nodded. Good call, he agreed. Come on, and stay quiet. He crept out of the bushes and led them silently across the asphalt. The zombies were headed in the other direction, the way they needed to go, but it was slow moving. The team headed across the parking lot of the apartment complex and peered into the busted front glass doors of the lobby. There were a few benches there, but no zombie activity. The soldiers took seats on either side of the wood-panelled room, and Farley leaned forward, leaning his elbows on his knees. Thoughts? he asked. Santos raised his hand. Couldn't we just go around them? he asked. Go through the woods. We can move way faster. That would be ideal, Barnes replied, leaning back against the wall. Except if we're to face significant opposition ahead, we don't want a few hundred zombies pressing up against our asses. Logan pointed out the broken door, off to the side of the parking lot. We could squash them. Farley turned and stuck his head out the door, raising his eyebrow at a large cherry-red four-wheel drive truck. That could work, for a few of them, he agreed, but not for all. The team headed outside, keeping their eyes peeled for any stragglers as they approached the truck. Wilcox let out a low whistle. Look at this puppy, he said appreciatively, running a hand along the hood. Not even a scratch on it, even with all this. It's about to get a workout, Sawyer declared. So, what's the plan, Sarge? Barnes asked if we can't take them all out with this. We punch through as far as we can and then shoot the fuckers, Logan cut in. Two of us drive out there and cause a giant ruckus from the truck bed while the rest of you pick them off from behind, while we hold their attention. The others looked to Farley for confirmation, and he rubbed his chin. Finally, he sighed. I guess it's our only option. He turned to Logan. I suppose that you want to be on the truck team, since you said us and we? The soldier nodded. Just need someone to hotwire it. On it, Burton said, and approached the driver's side door. Barnes grabbed the handle and tried it, finding it open. Let me guess, he drawled as he opened it for her and waved her in like a car salesman. High school? Middle school, actually, she replied with a wink, and then slid in under the steering column. The corporal laughed and shook his head. I'd like to go with Logan, Santos said, raising his hand. The burly private glowered down at him. No, you should stay with the others. I can do this, Santos said firmly, straightening his shoulders. You don't have to prove yourself to me by being stupid, Logan snapped. Enough, Farley cut in, tired of the back and forth between the two. Sawyer will go. He's got the sniper rifle so he can keep an eye on things and scout ahead from the top of the truck. As if on cue, the beastly vehicle sprang to life, and Burton got out, swiping her palms against each other. Your chariot, gentlemen, she said. Logan climbed into the driver's seat and Sawyer jogged around to jump into the passenger side. Be safe, Barnes said and smacked the side of the truck. Logan peeled out and headed for the road that would circle around to the highway. Let's move, Farley said, and they headed across the lot to wait on the grassy bank for their turn to take on the horde. You okay, man? Wilcox asked, bringing up the rear with Santos. The young private shook his head. I don't know what I did to piss Logan off, he muttered. I may not have seen any action before the apocalypse, but I've been living with zombies just as long as you guys have. He's not pissed off at you, Wilcox assured him, clapping him on the shoulder. He's really torn up about graves, and doesn't want to lose anyone else. Santos lowered his gaze. I get it, he admitted. I just... I want to be able to pull my weight. I don't want to let anyone down. Then stop worrying about it and just do it, bud, Wilcox said with a grin. We all have a job to do. Kill zombies and stay alive. Easy peasy. Santos chuckled and shook his head. Sure, man. Easy peasy. Good chat, Wilcox said and clapped his shoulder again. The team reached the grass and crouched down, just as the truck turned onto the highway to their right. Logan revved the engine a few times and then punched the gas, screaming towards the horde on their left. As the truck passed, they heard Sawyer's 
Boo! And the soldiers laughed, shaking their heads. Brace yourself, Logan yelled, and then the grill hit the back of the horde. They lurched forward in their seats, but still moved forward at a decent clip, chathunking over bodies and crunching skulls beneath the fat tires. The ghouls all turned towards the shiny red vehicle, now splattered in different shades of crimson, smacking at it as it went by, limbs flying everywhere. About two-thirds of the way across, the vehicle slowed to a stop. The tires, unable to move any more, likely due to corpses wedged too thick into the wheel wells. Showtime, Sawyer said, and opened the back window. He shoved his gun through and slithered out onto the bed. You gonna be able to get those thick-ass shoulders through there? Logan shoved his assault rifle through the hole and then gave his companion the figure. Gotcha, Sawyer replied, and raised the gun while he waited for his partner to squeeze through the window. He scanned the horizon on the far side where they were going, but was unable to see too far around the bend with all the trees in the way. All of a sudden, something brushed his leg and gave a sharp shriek. Sawyer instinctively kicked out, but an impossibly strong hand grabbed his ankle, and he yelled as he fell onto his back. A single booming shot rang out, and he looked up to see Logan standing over him, aiming his rifle at a limp corpse in military fatigues. What do you want to bet he was on the scouting team? Logan asked, and Sawyer shook his head emphatically. He got to his feet, brushing himself off, and then readied his assault rifle, leaving the scoped gun on the floor of the truck bed. Thanks, man. Good thing I could fit through the window, Logan replied dryly. We have to warn them somehow that there's runners, Sawyer said, searching frantically through the moaning crowd for more military gear or fast-moving bodies. Logan inclined his head to the sniper rifle. What if you got on top of the truck and picked them off? He asked. You should be able to see them, right? Good call, Sawyer agreed, and swapped guns, clambering on top of the rack attached to the top of the truck. He steadied his stance and peered down at the horde through the scope, scanning. He moved up at movement from the back and saw his team coming out of the grass, approaching with guns at the ready. He held up a hand to wave and it appeared that Barnes saw him, because he raised his hand back. Sawyer turned and did an exaggerated running on the spot, lifting his knees high, hoping they would understand what he was trying to say. There's one, Logan cried, pointing. It's heading their way. Sawyer immediately raised his rifle again, focusing on the path and saw a bold head moving jerkily through the thick crowd. He fired, and the bullet hit it in the shoulder not slowing it down in the slightest. As it grew close to the back of the horde, he didn't want to shoot it again, for fear of accidentally hitting one of his teammates, but it appeared they'd figured out what he was shooting at, because they took up defensive positions and waited for the runner to clear the shamblers. He sighed with relief as Farley took it out with a well-placed bullet to the face. Okay, you keep hunting runners, I'm gonna start taking out these bastards, Logan declared and began to fire rapid, precise shots, hitting zombie after zombie in the forehead. Meanwhile, Farley's gunshot attracted the back half of the horde, despite the rapid fire happening in the truck. Single burst! Make every bullet count! The sergeant barked, and raised his gun. His team did so as well, and they fanned out, creating a semicircle across the highway and shoulders to fire into the horde. Bodies fell, the bullets finding their marks, and Logan's shots continued to crack from the other side. Runner! Burton yelled from the far left side and backed up as she fired at a fast-moving ghoul. She hit it in the stomach and then backed up farther than she'd meant to, losing her balance and falling ass over tea kettle down the grassy hill. Santo screamed from beside her as the runner went skidding down for its tumbling meal. He leapt down after it without even thinking, and a group of zombies from the now weak left side went tumbling down after him. Sarge! Barnes cried helplessly as he watched the two disappear over the edge. Farley moved over to cover the hole, still firing. They can take care of themselves, keep going! He barked. And watch out for more runners! Sawyer took out the last runner he'd been able to spot, and then did a double-take when he saw Burton and Santos disappearing into the trees. 
the latter clearly limping as at least a dozen zombies followed after them, led by one in bloody fatigues. He turned and managed to take out a few ghouls, unfortunately not the runner, before they gave chase into the forest. Fuck, he cursed. A runner just chased Burton and Santos into the trees. Can't do anything about it right now, man, Logan snapped. If there's no more runners, you'd better start killing off some of these corpses here. Sawyer slid down off of the roof and took up his assault rifle, standing at Logan's back and picking off ghoul after ghoul. On the far side from where the two soldiers had run off, more zombies shambled out of the woods, heading towards the noise of the gunfire. He looked at the way they needed to go and was relieved to see that at least there wasn't anything coming around the bend. When his mag was empty, he reached down and picked up a chunk of rebar from the floor and began cracking skulls, bodies piling up around the truck as they thinned the horde. Sumali and the rest of the team were closing in, stepping over bodies and taking out ghouls from the other side. As the last few fell, leaving a rotted battlefield of carnage, all the soldiers turned to the last few stragglers emerging from the trees, save for Sawyer, who picked up his rifle to try to search for Burton and Santos. He couldn't see through the thick brush, and it didn't seem like any ghouls were coming out of the woodwork either. Fuck, he muttered under his breath. See anything? Logan asked. We have to go get them, Sawyer said, lowering the gun. Farley shook his head. We can't risk it, he said, though there was a note of sadness in his voice. We have to secure the airport. Sawyer swallowed hard. But— They know where they're going, the sergeant cut in. Once they've taken care of the danger, they'll meet us either on the highway or at the airport. Barnes shook his head. It's only us that can do this, he added. The last scout team didn't make it through here. Sawyer sighed and looked helplessly at Logan, but his companion avoided his gaze, simply jumping down from the truck, boots squelching in rotted guts as he hit the ground. Chapter 7 The team of five soldiers walked up the road towards the 405. As they came around the bend, they stopped short, eyes wide. Well, fuck, Sawyer blurted. The 405 was jam-packed with zombies, shoulder to shoulder, not really moving, just covering the highway like an undead carpet as far as they could see in either direction. How the hell are we going to get across? Wilcox threw his hands up. Should have saved the truck for this. Barnes shook his head. No, if we'd have tried to punch through with the truck, we would just draw them all to the airport. He cocked his head. We need to get past them without disturbing them. Sawyer raised his rifle, scoping the area. There's a river over there. Farley pulled out his map, running his finger along the water. Cedar River, he murmured. It runs right under it and right alongside the airport on the far side. Fancy a swim? Wilcox asked in his best British accent. Sawyer rolled his eyes. There are boats, dingus. He pointed, and when the rest of the team squinted, they could see a cluster of bright yellow canoes bobbing against a dock on the water. Even better, Wilcox exclaimed and slid down the embankment to make the trek to the water. The soldiers made their way through the grass, staying quiet as they didn't want to risk drawing any attention from the highway zombies. There were a few ghouls scattered about in the grass, but they were easily dispatched by Sawyer's rebar and his companion's knife. When they reached the dock, Wilcox leaned into one of the canoes and held up a metal paddle, holding it high over his head like a trophy. Sometimes we can get lucky, he said with a grin and gave it an experimental swing. The resounding whoosh made his grin even bigger, and he brushed past Sawyer to walk straight up to a zombie ambling along the riverbank. He swung hard, like a baseball player, and the wide part of the paddle thwacked against the ghoul's head, severing it from its body. The head sailed through the air and landed with a plonk in the water. Wilcox gave a mighty bow with a flourish as his teammates shook their heads in various states of amusement. I'm not riding with him, Logan quipped, and stepped down into one of the boats. Barnes got down after him, sitting in the middle seat. Sawyer, you're with us. Wilcox, ride with the Sarge, he instructed. 
We'll leave the third just in case the others come this way. There was an awkward moment of silence as they all thought of Burton and Santos, and then they pushed off from the dock and began quietly paddling towards the zombie-covered bridge. There was a splash ahead, and Sawyer muttered obscenities under his breath as a zombie from the bridge above tumbled over the railing and plunged into the water below. It was sporadic, but concerning. It's raining death, hallelujah, Wilcox sang quietly, paddling away. Farley took a deep breath. Keep an eye up, he instructed. Not like we can fast maneuver these things, Logan replied, as another ghoul went splash up ahead. No, but maybe we can bat them out of the air, Sawyer suggested. The soldiers held their breath as they grew closer and closer to the bridge, watching the ambling and writhing bodies moving against the railing above. A few seemed to notice the bright canoes below and reached out, the combined movement and pressure from the horde sending a few sailing down into the current. Go! Farley hissed, and Wilcox and Barnes paddled as hard as they could to get through the danger zone without incident. A few creatures fell just after them but plonked into the water behind the boats. Wilcox looked down, seeing a rotted corpse get stuck on the bottom of the river. At least they can't swim, he pointed out. We still don't want to be in that water, Farley replied. It's not like they can drown. The team went silent again as they approached the other side, more on edge considering they couldn't see what was coming from beneath the bridge. Now, the sergeant whisper yelled again as they reached the fall zone and the soldiers paddled mightily to propel themselves out of danger. A ghoul fell, arms flailing, and clipped Logan's back on the way down. He threw himself around, nearly knocking the canoe over, and both Sawyer and Barnes gripped the sides tightly, trying to overcorrect for the sudden dip in balance. "'You're good?' Barnes demanded, looking at the back of the boat, and Logan relaxed, nodding jerkily as the creature sunk to the bottom of the river. "'Yeah, fuck,' he replied. That was close. He looked up at the highway again, jutting out his chin at the corpses squirming about. You'll get what's fucking coming, he thought bitterly, and turned around to face front as they continued their ride to the airport. Chapter 8 You gotta let go of me, Santos begged as Burton practically dragged him through the woods, his ankle screaming at him. Just run! Shut the fuck up, she snapped, and then something hit her in the back like a battering ram. Burton went face first into the dirt, a shrieking and snarling animal on her back. Not an animal, she thought frantically. The runner. She flailed, bringing her elbow up instinctively to punt it in the face, regardless of the fact that if her elbow went into its mouth, she was done for. Thankfully, it connected with the ghoul's nose caving in part of its face, though not deterring it from lunging for her throat. She managed to wedge her arm into the crook of its neck, and it was so intent on her face that it didn't think to just bite her arm. But it was strong, the strength of a newly dead body that never grew tired. Her biceps threatened to buckle under the sheer power of it, and then it went limp. Burton blinked in surprise as the runner collapsed onto her and then Santos was there, withdrawing his knife from the back of its skull. She shoved the corpse off of her, and stared up at him in shock. There was no time for small talk, however, as three shambling ghouls appeared behind them. Move! she barked and scrambled to her feet, shoving him out of the way. She lowered her shoulder and barreled into the lead zombie, shoving it back into one of its friends. The third she kicked in the chest and then drew her knife, lunging down to stab it in the forehead. She snatched up a thick, broken stick from the ground and swung it like a golf club at the next zombie struggling to get to its feet, snapping its neck in the process. With the third pinned beneath the second, she stabbed it in the eye socket and then whipped around to make sure nothing else was coming out of the woodwork. We gotta move, she said, and dropped the stick, heading over to help Santos to his feet, or rather, his one foot. No, no, you gotta leave me, he hissed as she forced him up from the forest floor. I'm slowing you down. Burton glared at him. You just saved my life, idiot, she snapped. Come on. She hooked his arm over her shoulder and kept her knife at the ready in her free hand, 
as did he. I can't believe I did this to myself, he grunted. She shook her head. What, twisted your ankle, diving down a hill to try to save me from a runner? She asked. It could have been far worse. You're not going to die from an ankle sprain. When there's flesh-eating monsters chasing me, I can totally die from an ankle sprain, he pointed out. Burton couldn't help but laugh. I mean, I guess so, she agreed. But I'm not going to let that happen. Why? he asked, swallowing hard. I'm not good at being a soldier. How are you missing the part where you saved my life? She repeated firmly. I know you're all self-conscious because you froze up in front of that runner at Whitman Court, but this time you didn't freeze. You stabbed it in the head before it could eat me. She offered him a smile. Thanks, by the way. He shook his head. You're welcome, he replied. I'm still slowing you down now, though. Slow or fast, you can rest assured that I would rather have someone to talk to while I catch up to the others, she said. So you're not allowed to die, at least until then. He chuckled, loosening up a little. They probably didn't wait for us, huh? No, I wouldn't expect them to, she admitted. The gunfire stopped long enough ago that they should be well on their way past the 405 by now, barring any issues. But the lack of more gunfire is hopefully a good sign. Should we try to come back out on the road? Santos asked. She nodded. That's what I was thinking, she replied. At least we know for sure it's clear. That is, if they made it through the horde he pointed out, though he regretted the words as soon as they left his mouth. Burton raised an eyebrow. You are a depressing little dude, you know that? I'm taller than you, he shot back before he could even think, and to his surprise she laughed, shaking her head. Point made, she agreed, and then put a finger to her lips as she spotted a break in the trees ahead. They crept quietly to the tree line and peered out. To the right they saw the red track, surrounded by hundreds of corpses, splayed everywhere in an impressive display of carnage. They did it, Santos breathed, staring in awe at the bodies. Of course they did, Burton replied. Come on, let's have a look at that truck. He patted her shoulder and removed his arm, testing out his ankle a little. I think I'm okay, he said, putting a light amount of weight on it to limp along on his own. He waited at the bottom of the embankment as she climbed up to have a look. Burton scanned the area to make sure there were no stragglers and then knelt down to look at the wheel wells. Damn, she muttered, and then straightened up, turning around. Well, we should probably take the quiet route anyway. You sure you're okay to walk? As long as I don't have to go up there, I should be good, he replied. She slid down the grass and gave him a thumbs up. We'll be following the road towards the 405, she explained. I haven't heard any gunfire, so they shouldn't be fighting swaths of flesh-eating monsters to get to the airport. I like your optimism, Santos said, and they began to hobble towards the 405. Chapter 9 The soldiers got out of their canoes at the southernmost tip of the airport. Armed with metal paddles and rebar, they crept through the grass and crouched behind a row of bushes to have a look at what they were dealing with. Fuck, Sawyer breathed. The airport was covered in ghouls. Up shit creek once again, Wilcox said. But at least we have paddles. How do you want to play this, Sarge? Barnes asked, ignoring the quipping private. Farley pursed his lips for a moment, surveying the area. A fence ran around the long, thin property, buildings surrounding the long runway and stretching all the way up to Lake Washington, where the river mouth was. We'll need a distraction, the sergeant said. Draw out all of those things into the center, and then pick them off from varying cover around the outside. Wilcox held up his paddle. I bet one of these puppies could make a lot of noise, smacked against the right thing, he said. Good, Farley replied, pointing at him. You and Barnes run up through the center, there, and make a ruckus. When they're all good and clustered, make a run for it up the runway and circle back around to help us take them out. The corporal chuckled and shook his head, holding his hand out for Farley's paddle so he'd have two. Wilcox took Logan's. How's everyone doing for ammo? Farley asked. The soldiers checked their mags, and while the bullet situation was dismal, if they were precise it should be enough to take out the horde. 
The sergeant approached the fence quietly, and they moved along it until they found a loose bit of chain link they could peel back. Logan held it up so they could squeeze through and then popped through himself. Farley silently pointed at each of them, motioning which way to go, and the team all nodded, darting off in their respective directions. Wilcox and Barnes pressed themselves against a little outbuilding, peering out at the smattering of small planes from the aviation school. There were ghouls staggering about aimlessly, but none too clustered together. Okay, we run in on the right there, the corporal instructed, quietly, and smack the paddles against the planes as we go. If we can get to the line of cars over there, maybe we can get some alarms going. Wilcox nodded, holding his paddles up like dual death dealers. Let's make some noise, he said. The duo took off like a shot, tearing out onto the asphalt, legs pumping. Their boot falls alerted the zombies in the area, and they turned, mouths open, and arms outstretched. But they were slow, and the soldiers were fast. Woo! Wilcox hollered and held up one of his paddles as he ran underneath the row of small planes. The metal clanged off of the wings overhead, the noise echoing loudly. Barnes swung like a baseball player to get one zombie out of the way, not breaking stride, and banged his paddles together before reaching the wings and smacking them. Metal on metal. The distraction was working, the zombies excited for their loud meals. When they reached the other side, there was a line of ghouls waiting for them, and Wilcox grabbed the paddles together by the handles, holding them out in front of him like a double-ended sword. He barreled into the line, knocking back four ghouls and leapt over their fallen forms, tearing for the line of cars. Barnes was close enough behind him that he could jump over the writhing corpses, but skidded to a stop as a group of creatures poured out from between two vans. He dropped one of his paddles and swung the other, dislodging the head of the closest zombie. Wilcox whipped around and attacked from behind, jabbing forward with one of the wide ends the flat part sinking into a particularly rotted throat and severing its spinal column. He kicked the ghoul in the back, sending the corpse tumbling into its brethren. Barnes smacked another, and then grabbed his knife, stabbing a third in the head and throwing it into the few left standing to knock them over. The cars! he cried as the ghoul struggled to get to their feet. He glanced over his shoulder as the ones they had attracted from the earlier noise began to catch up. The duo brandished their metal weapons and began smacking the cars as hard as they could, all the way down the line. Their stomachs clenched as no alarms bleated, but they kept at it, running along the row. Wilcox ducked between two cars to hit them from the front, and Barnes whacked them from the back as hard as he could. A silver ritzy-looking sedan second to last finally erupted into the noise, the lights flashing and alarm blaring. Go! Barnes cried, looking back at the thickening horde catching up to them. The duo tore away from the cars, pumping their legs hard out onto the runway. They skidded to a stop at the sight of ghouls dotting the landscape, all wandering towards them and the source of the noise. Over there, Wilcox yelled, pointing at a hangar across the way. At a quick glance, it looked like it wasn't infested, and they sprinted for the area, knocking over a few ghouls in the process. Barnes ducked behind a big metal toolbox, pressing his back up against it to catch his breath. Seconds later, his companion joined him, and their chests heaved as they waited. Wilcox peeked out as the alarm continued to blare and saw the runway zombies shambling towards the cars. Thank fuck, he huffed, and set down his paddles, unslinging his rifle from his back. Good thinking with the alarm. Barnes nodded and checked his own gun. Once the rest of the runway zombies get over there, we'll head back out and start going from behind, he said, and, as if on cue, gunfire erupted from the distance. It seemed the rest of their team had begun their assault. Chapter 10 Left! Left! Burton hissed, and a zombie plunked into the water, narrowly missing their boat. Santos grunted. You know I don't have a steering wheel, right? He snapped. She turned around to growl something at him, but a grey blur plummeted between them as a body smacked into the centre seat of the canoe. It wasn't even phased by the impact, 
flailing around and clawing for Santos, mouth open in hunger. He instinctively swung the paddle, hitting it in the shoulder, causing it to fly off of the boat. The momentum swung the canoe wildly, and both of them wavered, leaning in different directions to try to steady it. Fucking hell, Burton breathed as they settled, finally floating under the bridge to relative safety. As ghouls hit the water up ahead from the other side, she took a deep breath. They must be really marshing up there. Santos chewed his lip for a moment. Should we go to one side? he asked. They seem to be falling more in the middle. It's shallower on the sides, she replied, shaking her head. At least this way we can float over them. He nodded, but inside his heart hammered. If one of those things fell in just the right spot, it wouldn't matter if it was too deep or whether the boat survived or what. A bite meant death. Okay, we'll float until just before, and then paddle like hell, Burton said, holding her oar up for emphasis. Deal, Santos replied. On your go. They held their breaths, floating lazily, closer and closer to the other side of the bridge. If they weren't in such a fucked-up situation, it would have been a nice relaxing trip. As it was, breaths held, stress pulsing through their veins. This boat ride was the farthest thing from relaxing. Plunk. Plunk. Splash. Go! Burton hissed, and they paddled like mad. Santos's heart leapt as they made it out the other side, and then plummeted as something hit him like a ton of bricks. He barely registered Burton's yell before he flew backwards into the river, the cold water enveloping him with a roar. The ghoul had him by the throat, and he kicked and tried to hold his breath, lungs screaming at the fact he hadn't taken a big one before he'd fallen. He pushed against the zombie, hoping that it would hit something, dislodge somehow. Santos's back scraped up against something hard, and he tried to orient himself. If that was the bottom, he curled himself up and kicked off, trying to account for the current. He wanted to draw his knife, wanted to stab at the creature, but he needed air. As stars exploded behind his vision, his mouth threatening to open and breathe water, his attacker suddenly went limp. He broke the surface of the river, gasping deep lungfuls of air, and whipped around to see Burton jerking her knife out of the ghoul's head. Are you okay? she sputtered, shoving the corpse away before swimming towards him. Santos nodded. Yeah, yeah, thank you, he stammered. You're not bit? she demanded. No, he replied, reaching up to touch his throat where the thing had pulled at him. He didn't feel any scratches, but he was sure there'd be a bruise there. Where's the boat? He looked back and forth and she pointed behind him. Down river, the yellow canoe bobbed away from them. We can swim up and catch it, but the oars are farther ahead, she explained. Santos nodded. I don't know about you, but I could use a rest, he admitted. Probably safer in the boat. Fair enough, she replied. You okay to swim with your leg? He nodded again. Yeah, the water actually feels good, he said. Don't need to put weight on it to swim. All right, let's go, Burton said, swimming downriver. Santos looked up at the bridge behind them the zombies against the railing reaching down to them with hunger in their glassy eyes. He shuddered, touching his throat one more time, and then swam after his companion. Chapter 11 As the car alarm began to shriek, Farley nodded in approval. Good job, soldiers, he said under his breath, and peeked out from behind the outbuilding he stood behind. Zombies poured out of everywhere, staggering towards the screaming car. When it seemed like the cluster had ceased to grow, he emerged from his spot, creeping along the wall and taking careful aim. Every bullet would count. As soon as he fired, two more shots rang out on either side of him, his team having waited for him to give them the go-ahead. Ghouls began dropping like flies, but the group didn't seem to care about the gunfire far more interested in the blaring car. The sergeant moved up, standing behind a waist-high chunk of engine that had been left out for some reason or another. He fired bullet after bullet, 
taking out creature after creature, and then the alarm stopped. The ghouls seemed to shiver as one, almost as if in confusion, but quickly realized that the car wasn't the interesting thing anymore. They began to writhe around, facing outwards into the sporadic gunfire. More shots joined from the far side as Barnes and Wilcox rejoined the fray from the runway. The cluster of ghouls began to disperse, wandering in all directions towards the shooting soldiers. Fuck, there are a lot of them, Farley muttered to himself. He wasn't sure if they'd be able to take them all out before any of them reached the perimeter. He began to walk backwards, still firing, at least fifty of the ghouls heading in his direction of the zombie star. He headed back down the building and sprinted around the back, darting down the alleyway between two buildings to pop out on the other side. He began to fire again into the thinner stream of ghouls that wandered where he'd been standing before. They quickly turned track and headed towards him. Sarge! Logan cried from across the asphalt, and Farley whipped around as a quartet of zombies approached him from behind. He leapt back into the alleyway, firing as he went, and ghouls staggered into the bottleneck, shambling over their fallen brethren to get to him. The sergeant finally turned and ran for the other end of the alley, but as he rounded the corner, he came face to face with a cluster of zombies that had come all the way around the back. How the fuck did you get back here so fast? He wondered frantically, and used the butt of his rifle to smack the first one in the face. The alley zombies were almost to the opening. With the close proximity, he knew he should flip to rapid fire, but he didn't want to waste the bullets. They were already short, as it was, without the full force of their team. He backed against the fence, still shooting one at a time, hoping for a hole or something he could duck through and then circle around to their original point of entry. Zombies fell, but it wasn't enough, and the alley zombies quickly filled the space between the building and the fence. Fuck it, he finally thought, flipping his gun into rapid fire, but before he could shoot, bullets began flying from beside him on the other side of the fence. He whipped around, eyes wide, to see Santos and Burton standing there firing through the chain link. Farley grinned and flipped his gun back to single burst, and with the combined force of the three of them, they took out the group of ghouls. You made it, he said breathlessly as the last one fell. Burton smirked. Thanks for leaving us a canoe, Sarge, she said with a little salute. We had a good swim anyway, Santos added, running a hand through his slick hair. There's a break in the fence just up there, Farley said, pointing. We tried to cluster those things in the middle of the Aviation Academy area, but they're all over the place now. Gotcha, Burton replied, and waved to Santos, who limped along after her. The sergeant shook his head and took off down the alley to help his team, thankful that he hadn't lost two more. You good, Sarge? Logan bellowed as Farley emerged from the alleyway. The sergeant nodded and aimed at a lineup of zombies staggering towards him on the right. Wilcox and Barnes had climbed up on top of the cars and were each standing atop their own tall van, shooting down into the ghouls below. Sawyer was nowhere to be found, but Farley knew he had to trust his team and focused on his own task. Chapter 12 Burton peeled back the loose section of chain link and all but shoved Santos through it. When we get out there, Find cover and make sure you're leaning while you're shooting, she instructed. I'm going to find some high ground and keep them from being able to flank you. I'm not an invalid, the kid mumbled. You will be if you don't take care of that ankle as much as you can, she shot back and clapped him on the shoulder. Come on. Santos managed a limping skip after her as they approached the same path Wilcox and Barnes had taken earlier. As soon as they came around the outbuilding, a pack of zombies greeted them, and Burton immediately opened fire, her rapid bullets finding their targets. They stepped over the fallen corpses and scurried forward to take stock of the carnage. There was a pile of crates just ahead, and Burton led him over to it, motioning for him to take his post there. Make those bullets count, she said, and clapped him on the shoulder, one more time before darting off behind the row of small planes knife at the ready. Santos raised his assault rifle, 
trying not to think about the sheer number of ghouls all over the airport. Most of them were facing away, heading towards the others, so he took his opportunity and began to blast them in the back of the head. After a few moments of shooting, ghouls honed in on his location. His mouth went dry, but he steeled himself. He remembered how he'd frozen when he'd seen that first runner. He remembered not freezing the second time when he'd saved Burton. He couldn't let his team down. He fired shot after shot, once or twice hitting a ghoul in the throat or shoulder instead of the head, but kept up the pace, trying not to count the yards closing in on him. He glanced over at the planes and saw Burton ducking in and around the machinery, leaping forward to stab a ghoul here and there, stealthing her way around. As she wrapped her hands around one of the wings and pulled her body on top of one of the small planes, he shook his head in amusement. Feeling better that she was up out of the way, Santos turned back to his targets. A snarl from the left startled him, and he let out a surprised yell at a cluster of ghouls approaching from behind him. He staggered away from the crates, not wanting to turn his back to the ghouls approaching from the airport proper. He backed away as he continued to fire, taking down as many ghouls as he could, but it didn't seem like enough. His heart pounded in his ears as he limped backwards, and then he put weight on his bad ankle at just the wrong ankle, and fell down onto his ass. Fuck! he yelled, but continued to fire, trying to push himself backwards across the ground with his good leg. There were too many, and for every one he dropped, two took its place. He looked frantically towards Burton, but he'd backed his way out of her sight. When his gun clicked empty, he grunted and dropped it, drawing his handgun and aiming. His hands shook, but he managed to hit three zombies in quick succession. But they were faster on their feet than he was on his ass, and he couldn't believe that this could be the end. All of a sudden, two ghouls right next to each other fell, their heads exploding simultaneously. More zombies' heads blew apart, and Santos blinked in shock, but didn't stop firing until his handgun ran out of bullets. He drew his knife, struggling to get up onto one knee, but Farley and Logan came around the side, firing into the horde and expertly dropping zombie after zombie. When there was nothing left but a pile of corpses, Santos sat back down on his ass, chest heaving with relief. Good to see you made it, Logan said and offered his hand. Santos smiled up at him and let him help him up. Are we clear? he asked hoarsely. The sergeant turned towards the airport proper, littered with bodies as the others came down from their perches. Sawyer waved from atop one of the outbuildings, and then crossed to the side to climb down a ladder attached to the outside. The soldiers met in the center of the aviation academy lot, looking around at their handiwork. Well, I hope the troops are still coming, after all that, Wilcox said, and gave Burton a playful punch on the arm. Did you guys enjoy your romantic giveaway? She rolled her eyes. Yeah, wine, cheese, and zombies, she retorted, running a hand through her wet ponytail and flicking water at him. Jealous? Secure the buildings, Farley instructed. I'll find the radio tower and call in the troops. There was a chorus of, yes, sir, and the soldiers headed off in groups of two to check all the buildings. Thankfully, everything was shut up tight, and they congregated outside of the radio tower. Captain Beltran, this is Sergeant Farley from the Renton Airport, he said into the mouthpiece. After a tense moment, the line sprang to life, and a gruff voice replied, Read you, Sergeant Farley. Status. The airport is secure, Farley said. You're clear to land. Cheers, Sergeant, the captain replied. Stand by. Yes, sir, Farley replied, and the line went dead. He headed back outside to join his team where Wilcox was chasing Sawyer around in a circle. Come on, I'm not all gooey this time, Wilcox cried, arms outstretched. Sawyer ducked around Burton, trying to use her as a human shield. No, the goo is rotting and you smell like shit. You don't smell like roses either, and I still love you enough to hug you, Wilcox said, much to the mirth of everyone else. He ended up wrapping his arms all the way around Burton, gripping her in a sandwich between him and Sawyer. Ugh, you are rank, 
she said with an exaggerated gag, and slid down out of the embrace, allowing Wilcox to wrap his companion in a bear hug. Farley shook his head and chuckled as Sawyer whined and moaned. He leaned against the door of the radio tower, crossing his arms and watching his team have a well-deserved break. Chapter 13 It didn't take long for the boats to arrive from Lake Washington, troops swarming the airport. Beltran approaches the ragtag team by the radio tower and nodded to them. Great work here, he said, inclining his head to the body strewn everywhere. How was everything on the way in? We had to come in by canoe up the river, Farley explained. The four o five is packed with those things. We wouldn't have been able to punch through. The captain smirked and raised his walkie-talkie to his lips. Bit crowded on the four o five, he said. Ten four, came the only reply, and Beltran put the radio back in his pocket. So, I hear that you're not the original team that was supposed to come out here, the captain said, cocking his head. Farley nodded. You heard correctly he replied. There was a scout team at dawn, but Captain Rocha lost contact with them, so he pulled us out of clean-up duty. Oh, I bet you were mighty disappointed by that, Beltran said, a mischievous twinkle in his eye. Laughter rippled through the group and the sergeant shook his head. Absolutely, he agreed, sarcasm dripping from his tone. We can't wait to go back. Did you find the other team? Beltran asked. Farley frowned. Yes, he replied. Seems they got caught by a horde on the road leading to the 405. We took it out and found runners. Shame, the captain replied, shaking his head. However, impressive that this is your second horde today. Before the sergeant could respond, helicopter blades cut through the air, and a chopper roared overhead. The whir of a minigun buzzed as it fired on the 405 zombies, clearing out a big space for them to work. As this happened, another fleet of boats arrived, and the soldiers followed the captain as he barked out orders. Troops ran every which way, carrying giant bags of ammunition and heavy machine guns, as well as other supplies. A soldier noticed Santos limping and approached him. "'What happened to your leg, Private?' he asked, eyebrow raised. Beltran immediately whirled around, suspicion in his eyes, but Burton threw up her hands. He just sprained it while we were fighting a runner, she said quickly, and the captain relaxed. Get him fixed up, he said, and another soldier nodded, waving for Santos to follow him. Come on, I got some cold packs in one of the first aid kits, he said, and led Santos away. Not to insinuate that you weren't following protocol, Beltran said to a still bristling Burton. Come on, we have to set up camp. If you all don't mind giving us a hand, we could use a distraction while we set up the guns. Farley nodded. Do you have a more comprehensive map of the area? He glanced around at his team. And some spare ammo? The captain led them over to a cluster of soldiers on the side of the runway. Corporal, let the sergeant here have a look at your printout, he said, and his subordinate nodded, stepping aside to reveal a few papers spread out on top of a toolbox. Beltran turned to one of the privates. Put together a care package for this team. They're in distraction duty. Yes, sir, the soldier said and hurried off. Thank you, Captain, Barnes said. Beltran nodded to them. See you on the highway, he said, and then headed off to organize his troops. Sarge, Sawyer said as he sidled up next to Farley. When I was scoping ahead, I think I saw something that would be perfect. He ran his finger along the 405 on the map, pointing to a few buildings on the airport side. It's got to be one of these. The sergeant cocked his head. What did you see? Right around here, one of these buildings, is a burger joint, Sawyer explained. They'll have a kitchen. He trailed off, letting the insinuation hang in the air. Barnes grinned. You want to blow up a burger joint? I mean, that would attract some attention, right? Sawyer asked sheepishly. Farley nodded. Definitely would, he agreed, and turned to the returning private who'd been sent for ammo. You wouldn't happen to have any explosives in that care package, would you? Of course, the soldier replied with a grin. Distraction duty pack, right here. He patted the duffel bag he held and passed it over. 
The sergeant took the bag and inclined his head. Thanks, soldier. Barnes checked their route as the team replenished their mags. Shouldn't be too much resistance, it's a few blocks, he said. Here, Wilcox handed the duffel to Sawyer. You hang on to the dynamite. The sniper raised an eyebrow, taking it and slinging it over his shoulder. Am I your pack horse? Be a gentleman, hm? Wilcox replied, batting his eyelashes. Beltran's corporal snorted a laugh and then schooled his expression to try to hide his mirth. Let the captain know we'll be blowing up this burger joint, Farley said, pointing it out on the map. We're heading out now. Yes, sir, the corporal replied and gave a salute. The team headed out, taking the airport road across the river, guns at the ready. Man, I could go for a burger, Burton said as they approached the first intersection. A big, greasy double-decker with special sauce. Wilcox grinned mischievously and opened his mouth. No, she immediately cut him off, holding up a finger. Not your special sauce. He shook his head. You don't know what you're missing. I was always partial to bacon cheeseburgers, Barnes piped up. Sawyer moaned with longing. With pickles. No ketchup, though, Logan said. Mustard and relish only. Terrorist! Wilcox gaped at him. Who doesn't like ketchup? It's sugar paste with a side of ass, Logan replied. Stay sharp. Melee only, Farley cut in as they rounded the corner onto Third Street, seeing some zombie stragglers spread out in the road. Also, I might have to demote you, Logan. A burger without ketchup is a travesty. Wilcox laughed. Zoya, give him the duffel, he said. He's being demoted to pack, bitch. He talks about jizzing on a burger, and I'm the one getting demoted? Logan scoffed. Sawyer patted him on the shoulder. If you've ever eaten at a burger joint staffed with teenagers, he said, you've 100% eaten jizz on a burger. Disgusting, Burton added with a shudder. Teenage boys are the worst. Barnes gave her the side eye. Like you never did anything gross when you were a teenager, he said, and then took a run at a ghoul ahead, stabbing his knife into its eye socket. I was pure as the mountain snow, Burton replied, giving a fake curtsy before ducking around a car to stab a zombie in the top of its skull. I call bullshit on that, Sawyer quipped as he kicked a creature in the chest, knocking it back, and then knelt to stab it in the face. Farley jogged up to a trio of ghouls in the middle of the road, smashing the first one with the butt of his gun and sending it tumbling back into the one behind it. He lashed out with his knife to sever the head of the one still standing, and Logan quickly dispatched the two on the ground. "'What about fries?' Barnes asked as he caught up to them. "'What do you dip your fries in if you don't eat ketchup?' Logan rolled his eyes. "'Gravy,' he replied. "'Obviously.' "'Gravy and ketchup?' the sergeant said as he viciously kicked a zombie in the face, caving its head in. "'Y'all are disgusting,' Logan muttered, shaking his head. They approached the intersection before the burger joint, and Farley and Barnes peered around the corner. There were a smattering of ghouls ambling around the parking lot, and the doors stood open. "'Sawyer, Wilcox, Burton, you get in and clear the place,' the sergeant instructed as he ducked back around to face them. The rest of us will clear the parking lot and keep watch. Get the gas going, light the dynamite, and get the fuck out of there. We'll backtrack a block and take a side street to meet up with the troops heading for the 405. The team nodded and then broke cover as one. The inside team ran past the parking lot ghouls, leaving them for the rest, and burst into the restaurant, guns at the ready. There were no patrons, but two zombies turning towards them from behind the counter, dressed in tattered fast food uniforms. Would you like fries with that? Wilcox quipped and fired two quick shots to dispatch both creatures. I got the gas, Sawyer said, sliding over the counter and heading into the back. Get ready to run. Gunfire peppered the parking lot outside, and Burton stood watch at the door as the rest of the team took out the ambling ghoul staggering around the drive through window. Sawyer turned on all the burners, letting the gas hiss out, and dropped the dynamite by the door to the kitchen unwinding the long fuse as he backed into the dining area. He knelt down just behind Burton and pulled out his lighter, lighting the end. Let's go, he cried, and the trio rushed outside. We're hot, Wilcox declared, 
and the soldiers took off down the road the way they'd come. A few zombies wandered out from between buildings, having been drawn by the gunfire, but they ran past them until they got to the intersection at the halfway point to the airport. Looking down the side street, they saw the tail end of the troops at the other end of the block, heading for the 405. Farley led his team at a light jog, and about halfway down the block, a boom shook the air, rattling all the windows on the street. A car alarm blared in the distance, just adding to the noise, and the sergeant nodded to Sawyer. Good plan, Private, he commended. His subordinate grinned. Thanks, Sarge. Chapter 14 The now hundred-strong force of soldiers trekked to the 405, coming up on the wide highway now littered with bodies. Troops immediately set to building makeshift barricades out of the corpses, others getting the machine guns ready. There weren't any ghouls in the immediate vicinity, the bulk of what had been left from the minigun fire drawn to the burning burger joint. Farley stepped up to the firing line, watching as the soldiers set up the fifty cows. This is much nicer than taking them out with fence posts and boat paddles, he said, and shared a laugh with the gunner before patting him on the shoulder. He turned and spotted Santos sitting in the grass, leg elevated. Another soldier took off his boot, revealing a massively swollen ankle. Ah, that's so much better, Santos groaned as the soldier activated a cold pack and wrapped it around his injured joint. You going to live, Private? the sergeant asked as he reached him. Santos nodded jerkily. Sure thing, Sarge, he replied. Would be stupid to go down because of a tweaked ankle. We've been over this, Burton drawled as she approached with two bottles of water, handing one to the sitting private. You're not allowed to die until I'm bored of your company. Santos chuckled as he unscrewed the cap. I guess I'd better brush up on my conversation skills. Damn straight, she said, and bumped her water bottle against his. Before long, the gunners began to take care of zombies heading towards camp, the bullets easily tearing them to shreds at a safe distance. As the sun set, Captain Rocha and his team reached the camp, and he gave them instructions before seeking out Beltran. Farley spotted them and approached. Good job today, Sergeant, Rocha commended. Thank you for your contribution. Farley nodded. No sweat, Captain, he replied. Appreciate the assignment. You can head back to town and continue cleanup duty, Rocha said, jerking a thumb over his shoulder. Once you and your men have had a little rest, of course. The sergeant's face fell. He didn't want to go back there. Using fence posts to clean up after the main teams had not been his idea of a good time, despite how he'd scolded Santos for saying so at the beginning of the day. Beltran cleared his throat. Actually, Captain, if it's all right with you, he began, I'd like to keep Sergeant Farley and his team here with me. I have a mission that I think would suit them perfectly. Rocha raised an eyebrow. Oh? he asked, and tilted his head at Farley, who looked up in excitement. Would you prefer staying? I mean, the sergeant trailed off with a shrug. Should I try to look sad about not getting to go back to cleanup duty? The trio shared a laugh, and Beltran clapped him on the back. Thank you, he said. I have some plans that I think you could really help me out with. You got it, Captain, Farley replied with a grin. Rocha nodded. All right. I'll leave you to it, he said. I need to report to Captain Kersey. Good job today, everyone. I'll find you in a bit, Beltran added. The sergeant saluted them and then headed off, finding his team clustered around Santos, taking a chill in the grass. Well, it looks like we're hanging out here for a while, Farley announced as he took a seat next to Barnes. Beltran's got a mission for us. Fuck yeah, Wilcox cried, pumping his fist into the air. No clean-up. Sawyer grinned, leaning back and curling his hands behind his head. That news was worth the hugs, he declared, and the team shared a laugh. Farley shook his head and accepted one of the water bottles, taking a long swig and stretching out in the grass with his team for a well-deserved rest. Chapter 15 Captain Kersey took a thoughtful sip of his coffee, unable to shake the feeling of helplessness running deeply beneath the hope he was so afraid to let bubble up in his chest. 
Things seemed to be working, but it was dangerous to hope that everything was going to go according to plan. Of course, a lot hadn't so far, but it seemed most things were pulling through regardless. But at what cost? The soldiers knew what they were getting into, to be sure, but so many lives had been lost. We follow our orders to build this new world, he reminded himself. They all had to do their part so that there would be a world for future generations. He could easily picture it. The whole northwestern front behind military barricades, families safe behind the walls, living their lives as best they could. He just hoped there were enough people left to save. There was a knock at the door of his makeshift office, and it shook him out of his reverie. Come in, he said hoarsely, and then cleared his throat. Hey there, Captain, David said, poking his head in. I've got Captain Roger with a report for you. Kersey nodded, his chest feeling lighter already. Good news, I hope, he said, and headed for the door. Well, he's alive, so that's a good sign, David replied, scribbling away on one of his clipboards. I have other reports for you as well once you're done, he said as they reached the communications area. Kersey nodded as he sat down at the radio. Thanks, David, he said, and picked up the receiver. Captain Roger, this is Captain Kersey. Evening, Captain, Roger replied. Kersey looked at his half-empty mug of coffee and rubbed his forehead. Evening, right, he murmured to himself, and then pushed the button. Evening, how did the day go? Despite our setbacks, surprisingly well, Roger replied. We're well on our way to clearing out Renton, and thanks to a team led by Sergeant Farley, we were able to secure the airport and the 405 for the southern blockade. Excellent news, Kersey said. Keep up the good work, Captain, and be safe. You as well, Rocher replied. The line went dead, and Kersey swiveled around in his chair. David stood there holding a fresh pot of coffee. The captain grinned and held out his cup allowing his communications expert and fellow caffeine addict to fill it for him. He took a long sip of the hot brew and let out a sigh of pleasure. "'Well, what have you got for me?' he asked. David filled a mug for himself and then set down his clipboard on the desk. "'The northern flank is starting to gain ground, despite their setbacks,' he began. "'Everything seems to be happening despite setbacks,' Kersey murmured, shaking his head. Well, navigating the zombie apocalypse isn't exactly experienced territory, David replied with a dark smile. I'd say we're doing pretty well, considering. The captain nodded. Tell me about this horde in Tacoma, he said. David headed over to his monitor, typing away to bring up a satellite image of the area. The Olympia team has successfully taken over that area and seems to be in a position to deal with the horde, he explained. We're able to send in some tomahawks to take care of the ones not on the interstate, but for the seventy or eighty thousand that are— Kersey shook his head. We can't risk damaging the interstate, he finished. We're going to have to figure out a plan of action. He stroked his chin. How can we pull more of the zombies towards them, away from Renton and the northern flanks? What about air support? David asked. Send in some helicopters to pull them back. The captain sighed. I don't think we have the resources for that, he replied. Word from the higher-ups always seems to be no when it comes to air support. I suppose nothing from the Renton airport will be useful unless we could graft some heavy guns onto the side, David mused. Though that would be fun, I doubt we have the guns nor the ammo, let alone the tools. Kersey nodded. We'll likely have to go with decoy teams, he said, taking a sip of his brew. But before I go delegating... I think it would be best to kick it up the chain of command to someone with better intel. Probably a good idea, David agreed, and scribbled on his clipboard. How is Copeland's team? the captain asked, leaning back in his chair. The communications expert moved to the map. They have the bridge secure and are holding strong, he replied, but there are concerns about hordes, big and small, heading their way. Have the reinforcements gotten there? Kersey added. David nodded. Yeah, and they're planning to push up into the next town to set up some traps and diversions, he replied, tilting his head back and forth. But they're hoping for some more intel on the area so they really know what they're getting into. 
All right, get someone in touch with them so they can plan accordingly, the captain replied. How about Brett's? The communications expert shook his head, drawing his lip between his teeth. Nobody's reached them yet, he replied slowly. Kersey pushed the dark thoughts from his head and raised his chin, speaking quickly. What's the news on the Eastern Front? They're pushing towards the water still, David replied, moving the map once again and motioning to the area he knew the teams had been last. They should be there by tomorrow. It's slow going through the neighborhoods with the lack of ammunition. The troops are starting to rely on whatever they can find to fight with. The captain pursed his lips and sighed. That will slow things down significantly, he mused. What's the hold-up on the supply lines? They're breaking down, David explained. Just outside of Spokane, there is a broken train that has the rails all tied up, so one of the shipments has to be unloaded. They're trying to move supplies by bus and truck, but both are in short supply, not to mention the shortage of gasoline. Kersey took a deep breath. We're going to have to do some scavenging, it seems, he said. Get the next group of soldiers headed to the front lines to start searching every house for weapons and ammo, with every town they pass along the way. He motioned to the clipboard. And relay that up the chain of command. Anything they can find will be helpful. Done, David murmured, scribbling away on his list. Okay, Mercer Island, the captain began, leaning forward to lean his forearms on his knees. How's it going? David pulled up the island on his screen. It's totally secure, which is good news, he replied. The bridge barricades are holding, but they're going to need supplies too if they're going to keep up with the diversions. Looks like the diversions are going well. Kersey stared at the significant dark blotches of zombie hordes on both banks of the lake. Exceedingly well, David agreed. Get them what we can, the captain said and leaned back again, taking the last sip of his coffee. David nodded, adding that to his list and then crossing the room to grab the coffee pot again. He refilled their mugs and offered a tentative smile. You know, we're really getting through this thing, he said as he took a seat. It's almost safe to start thinking about the future. Kersey chuckled, shaking his head. I was just thinking this morning about how nice it would be to safely think about the future. I can't stop imagining having a nice place to call home, David said wistfully. A house packed to the tits with electronics. I could be the world's foremost authority on drones, he cocked his head, which should be easy given there are only a handful of us left that can actually fly these things. The captain laughed. That would be the life, he said. Get you a nice big mansion and stuff it full of computers. I don't need a mansion, David replied with a smirk. Okay, maybe I would for all the equipment I'd want to have. Turn the hoity-toity drawing room into a workshop. Kersey leaned his chair back, lifting his feet to cross them on the desk. If we could find one with a helipad, he continued, you could have a whole army of drones ready to lift off when somebody shines the David signal in the sky. Oh, there's an idea, he agreed, nodding like a bobblehead. Post-apocalyptic techie superhero. I like that. They shared a laugh and then sat in silence for a few moments, sipping their brew. What about you? David finally asked. What's your dream for when this is all over? A wave of exhaustion washed over the captain, and he scrubbed a hand down his face. A good night's sleep, he replied. Maybe a good week's sleep all at once. Hook you up to a feeding tube? David asked, grinning around his mug. We could knock you out with a drug cocktail and keep you in a coma for a few months. That might catch you up on at least some of the rest you've missed these last few weeks. Kersey chuckled swirling his coffee around in his mug. Yeah, that would be bliss. Really, though, David pressed on. What will you do? A million scenarios ran through the captain's head. Meeting a nice girl, maybe a badass retired soldier, someone who could keep up with him mentally and physically, and understand what it's like to have gone through the things he'd seen in his life. Maybe they find a nice little villa on the coast, far away from the barricades and the fighting, a place that would be quiet and secluded. Maybe they settle down there, spending the days hanging out on the beach and the evenings reading books on the front porch while watching the sun go down. Maybe they get married, if there are still any officiants left somewhere. Brett's at his side, Kowalski cracking jokes behind him. Maybe they have kids when it's safe to do so.
because maybe this whole thing works out and it becomes safe to do so. Maybe they raise beautiful, happy children by the ocean, teaching them all they need to know about the world, the new world, and what it's going to be, away from the horror of rotted walking corpses that cannibalize your flesh. But Kersey knew his life wasn't built on these maybes. He took a deep breath. The downside of being good at what you do, he said softly, is that everybody wants you to do it again and again. David swallowed hard but nodded in understanding. At least, Captain, you can do what you're good at, knowing you're bringing a safe life for the future of humanity. Kersey chuckled softly and held up his mug for a cheers. My life's work, he declared, will be to find a giant spotlight big enough to write your name in the sky. I'll drink to that, his friend replied, clinking his mug. To Super David. The captain shook his head and smiled. To Super David. The End up next, salty Vietnam vet Benny uses his piloting skills to deliver much-needed supplies around the city in Seattle, Part 7. <laughs>